Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. I know where I told you to be, and I want you just to listen to this first part that I'm going to read to you out of Deuteronomy 28. And you shall eat the fruit of of your own body, the flesh of your sons and of your daughters, which the Lord your God has given you, in the siege and in the straightness wherewith your enemies shall distress you, so that the man who is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil towards his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave. So that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat. Because he has nothing left left him in the siege and in the straightness. Wherewith your enemies shall distress you in all your gates. The tender and delicate woman among you which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness. Her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter. And toward her young one who comes out from between her feet, and toward her children which shall which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege of straightness, wherewith your enemies shall distress you in the gates. Boy, that's a that's ominous, isn't it? <laughs> but let me tell you something. When you're away from God, you cannot expect his blessings. And it doesn't matter what you do or what you say or how good you think you want to live. If you're away from God, there's a curse. Amen. And that curse is what they were talking about. And this was a warning in Deuteronomy. Hey, listen, if you don't get close to God, if you don't stay with God, this is what's going to happen. There will be a time where even in the gates, even in your own houses, you will eat the flesh of your sons and your daughters for, for want because you, you have nothing else. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your blessings. Lord, you know me and you know all of us inside and out. You know the trials, you know the temptations, you know the struggles, and you know the answer. So, Lord, I ask you right now, less of me, more of you. Lord, put your words in my mouth. Let me just be a vessel to contain and disperse your words. Lord, I thank you for your love. Lord, let nothing be said of, uh, of any manner that it comes from him. But, Lord, it only comes from you that does us good. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Look around and uh, give a wave to somebody. Amen. Just, just look at each other. Good to see you. Good to see you. I told you I was going to preach on 2 Kings chapter 7, but you have to go all the way back to chapter 6. Let me explain something to you first, though. Um, There's a siege going on, just as the word predicted. There's a man by the name of Benadad, and he's besieging Samaria. And um, to make this easier, there was an alliance. Thank you very much. Because they never just went, just one group against another. They always pulled in relatives and family and, oh, you're from this tribe and that tribe. So we'll just say Benadad's army, for lack of a better term. Benadad's army besieged Samaria. And what they would do was, in Samaria, they would never build towns outside of a water source because water was the number one crucial thing. And they would build walls around their towns over a water source so nobody could cut off their water. And if you were the enemy and you were coming to take over that town or that city, you would put your troops all the way around. So it was a waiting game. And they would wait until all the food was gone until they finally just gave up. A lot of times there wouldn't even be any death. They'd just start to starve. They'd say, okay, we give up. And they'd come in and take spoil and everything. Well, they hadn't given up yet. And inside this town was a man by the name of Elisha, a prophet of God. Now, what's going on here is it's gotten so bad that for silver, they're buying uh, dove dung, dove poop, and they're eating that. 
and for like uh, two ounces of silver, and you'd get just a little bit. Uh, they were they were eating the, the the donkeys or the horses' heads. I mean, this is this is what they were doing, trying to get as anything they could to gain sustenance, and they were just starving to death. As a matter of fact, there's a there's a place in here where two women agreed that one day we will eat, we'll kill and eat my son, and then the next day we'll kill and eat your son. And the two women agreed, and so the first day happened, they killed and ate the first boy, and the second day happened, and the lady went to the other and said, hey, didn't we agree to kill your son and we're going to eat? She said, uh, I can't find him. You're a liar. You're hiding him. She's like, no, no, I'm not. She said, I'm going to take you before the king. Now, the king was feeling the pains of hunger also. They take you before the king and the king's like, hey, what am I supposed to do here? What am I supposed to do? I'm hungry too. It's not like I have storehouses filled up waiting to feed you people. It was a distressful time. So now let's go to verse num- or chapter number six. And verse number 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, and such, such, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong chapter. Uh, chapter 6, verse number 30. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman, the story I just told you, that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth upon his flesh. Then he said, God, do so and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. In other words, God's doing this, and his prophet, since I can't get to God, I'm going to decapitate his prophet. Because he's bringing all this. How many of us have ever been in that situation? We're, We're hurting, we're down, we're low, and guess what? It's God's fault. God has, now, I know y'all are all saints. Let me tell you something. I blame God before. I have. How many of you have? Hmm? Yeah. Why has God let this happen to me? Why am I going through this situation? I don't understand it. I don't see the end of the, uh, the end of the tunnel. There's nothing good that's going to come out of this. Why am I in here? And God says, hey, look, I've got an answer. Sometimes you have to be patient, though. And I'm not good on patience. How about you? I'm learning it, though. I'm learning it very well. <laughs> Verse number 32. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him. And the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See you how the son of a murderer has sent to take away my head. Look when the messenger comes. Shut the door and hold him fast at the door. It's not the sound of his master's feet behind him. Now I want you to picture this. Elisha is sitting in this room and all the elders of the city were around him. And he couldn't even see him. He couldn't even see this servant. But God told him what was going to happen. You see, when you're a child of God, God will give you information. Amen? But it's at His time and in His will, and you've got to be in line with God. Uh, Elisha didn't, uh, probably wasn't praying for it. He was sitting there probably praying about the seed and wondering what God's going to do. And God told him, He said, hey, listen, somebody's coming to take your head. And He's sending His servant before Him, but the Master's coming right after Him. So this is what's going on. And while He yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto Him. And he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? So obviously the king had petitioned Elisha, Go see God. Tell us what's going to happen. And now the king's tired of waiting. Look, things are getting desperate. They're eating people out here. I'm not waiting on God anymore. As a matter of fact, you're going to die. Why should I wait on God anymore? Let me tell you something. We may not have said those words, but we've been pretty desperate before. How about you? Amen? And a lot of times, we don't resort to maybe take it off, maybe we want to, but we don't resort to taking off somebody's head. But what we resort to is our best thinking. Can I get an amen? I can fix this. I can, I can remedy this situation. Hey, sometimes God puts you in the situation because you can't fix it. Because there's nothing you can do. So you'll rely on Him more fully. Can I get an amen? How many of you have grown closer to God through hardship, through trouble, and through turmoil? Look around, church. Amen? Every one of us have, and that's exactly why God put us there in the first place. Can I get an amen? amen. Hey, listen. <laughs> We're not saints yet. We may be covered in the blood, but we ain't perfect. Can I get an amen? And we're going to hear about some imperfect people. Verse number 1, chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Let me ask y'all a question. Whose word was it? 
It's the Lord's word. Now let me ask you again. Whose word was it? All right. Got 100% on that one. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall I measure a fine flour, not even, not even barley, a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel. It's like a penny. And two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then the Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God. Now let's stop right there. If you want God to work in your life, and you want the abundance of heaven to be poured out in your life, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Three points, and then I'm going to shut up. Number one, believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. When God's word says it, you can believe it. God's word is quick and power and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's quick. It's there when you need it. Not there when you want it sometimes. Talk to me, church. Sometimes we want God. You see, God and his word are one. That's what it says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You see, so everything that is in the pages of that book right there is absolute honest, is absolute truth. And though we've been raised it, we've heard it all our lives, and it gets kind of humdrum sometimes. Talk to me, saints. It gets kind of, you know, you hear it over and again, and it kind of just runs over you. You don't really take it to account. You see, if, if the doctor says something to you, you, you say, oh, okay, and you take it as truth. If a lawyer says something to you, okay, okay, I get that. Yeah, I take it as truth. If the banker says, this is how much is in your account, we take it as truth. But when God says, I will not let it come nigh to you, how often do we step back and say, I believe your word. I believe I'm in your protection. I believe you will raise me up. I believe that no matter how down I am, how frustrated I am, how sick to death I am, how worried I am, how sorrowful I am, God, you will answer. You will come through. Oh, well, give me praise, church. You've got to believe the word of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, it's true, church. It's absolutely true. There is nothing false. It cannot be disproven. They've tried it over and over again. The biggest names in atheism have tried time and time. Scientists have tried time and time again to disprove the word of God. And nine times out of ten, they end up becoming Christians. Because you cannot disprove it. It is truth. And the word will stand when everything else fails you. When everybody else fails you. When people give up on you and they turn their backs. God's word will not fail you. When there's nothing in the way, God's word will be there. When you feel bad and your body's sick and you're aching and you don't understand what's going on, God's word will be there. His word will stand forever. <laughs> some may trust in chariots and some in horses, but I will remember the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And every word in that book is the name of the Lord. It has his stamp of approval and it will not fail. <laughs> oh, we serve a mighty God, church. Do you believe him? Then give him a hand clap of praise. He deserves it. Hallelujah. See, right here in verse number one, uh, verse number two, then the, then a Lord, in other words, the king's servant, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the, he was smart aleck. How many of you like those smart aleck people? I'm talking about the ones that will interrupt halfway through a sentence just to put some smart aleck in there. There's a guy I know that every time I try to describe what my car is doing and I make the sound, he thinks it's hilarious to go, now how'd that go again? I'm like, look, I'm trying to tell you something. Man. Now how'd that go? That's not funny to me. The first 50 times I might have snickered and humored him. Now I just look at him and keep going. Hmm? Smart Alex are everywhere. And they seem to multiply when you're not in a good mood. They seem to pop up out of nowhere. 
especially when you're stressed out about something. You let a bill come due that you're stressed out about it, and then five others will follow it. And then before you get out of the house, somebody's texting you, blowing up your Facebook, calling your phone, troubling you. You get in your car, somebody pulls out in front of you, and the person sitting next to you will make a smart little comment about your driving. Stretch your hands this way. We're going to pray right now. <laughs> She's driving. That's me. This guy was an absolute smart aleck. Listen to what he says. If the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? <laughs> Real funny. Black! Back of my hand. I felt the spirit. Amen. Here's what's going on. And he, Elisha, picked up on his sarcasm. Let me go ahead and fill in the blank there. He picked up on his sarcasm. Elisha's like, oh, who did I say? Who, who did the Bible say? Who did Elisha say? Word was this. Whose word was that? It was the Lord's word. So essentially what he was doing was mocking God. And Elisha, let me tell you something, church. You have an elder brother. When you stand on the word and you say a word in the name of God, when you stand on a promise of God that he's made and has never failed you, and somebody starts mocking you, they're mocking God to his face. Can I get an amen? And see, you don't have to go back on them. You don't have to go and give them a bad look, write them a nasty letter, kick them in the shins. Know that God has it. Come on, say amen, church. That's kicking me right in the shins right now. Amen. Let's go on. He said, Behold, you shall see it with your eyes. But you shall not eat thereof. He told him next that the next day this is going to happen. He said the next day this is going to happen. So in this, essentially, he's saying, "Look, you got a death sentence on you. You'll see it, but you'll you'll not even eat of it. You won't even taste of it." Let me tell you something. There is disbelief all over. And there are disbelieving quote unquote Christians that believe God on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. They believe God on Wednesday nights, but they don't believe God on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday day, Thursday and Friday, even Sunday afternoons and Saturdays. They don't believe God because they don't believe that his judgment is real. They don't believe that he rules in majesty and power. They don't believe because you can tell by the lifestyle. Can I get an amen? You can tell by the fruits of their bearing or the fruits they're not bearing. So they don't believe when they're tried and they're found wanting. And there will be a whole lot of proclaiming Christians that when Jesus comes back will be left here. Why? It's not that they didn't take part in the suffering. The servant was taking part in the suffering. But it's because of disbelief. We've got to believe that when God says, hey, be in my house, we're going to be in his house. When God says, hey, put my tithe first, we put his tithe first. When God says give your talents to him, he means give your talents to him. When he says use your whole body in the service of God because your body is the temple of the Lord. What? Know ye not that your body is not your own and is the temple of God? When he says those things, he means those things. You see, that's faith in God. And I have been guilty of not having that kind of faith. I have been guilty even as a pastor of worry, of doubt, of depression, of oppression. Amen. Because I am no different than anybody else. Satan attacks all of us. And he will convince us that but this way seems right. And this way seems right. And then Proverbs screams at us. He says, there is a way that seemeth right under man, but the end thereof is destruction. Amen. Listen, we got to quit having so much faith and trust in ourselves. Yeah. And we got to put that faith and trust that we have in ourselves and our abilities and put it on God. Because his track record is perfect. Can I get an amen? Let's give God praise for his track record. Amen. Hallelujah. He deserves it. Now, watch this. You want God's blessings in your life? You want him to open those windows in heaven? <laughs> Number one. Believe the word. Number two, write this down. Do something. Can you say it with me? Do something. One more time. Do something. One more time. Do something. All right. 
Let's see what happens. Look at verse number 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Hmm. It's pretty good. But, you know, I've heard people say, the doctor said I wouldn't have but about a month to live. And you know what those people do? Some of them, <laughs> some of them, they'll go home and they'll sit there and they'll just wait to die. And then there are other people who will do everything they can within that month to live life to its fullest. Now, to try to make what life they have lived worthwhile. These leprous men, they had a death sentence on them. They were pretty much the walking dead. Can I get an amen? There was no cure for leprosy. They would, their skin and their bodies would just deteriorate until they died. These leprous men, they could sit, if that was the gate to the city, they could sit about this far away, and when somebody came near to the gate of the city, they would have to holler out, unclean, unclean, stay away, because it was contagious, and they didn't want anybody to catch it, and nobody wanted to catch it. They could be killed on the spot if they didn't holler that out. Every day, they'd holler out, unclean. Every day, it was just another second in a march toward death. There was no cure, and there was no hope in sight. And just as they were suffering on the inside of the walls, they were suffering on the outside of the walls. Amen? Let me tell you something, church. They're suffering on the inside of the church, and they're suffering on the outside of the church. At least we have hope. What are we doing getting filled up and saying, okay, I've done my job. I've gotten the word in me. Instead of sharing it with those people that need God's word. These lepers were left out there. And they started reasoning, hey, why are we just sitting here doing nothing? Until we die. Verse 4. If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come. And let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. In other words, what do we have to lose? You see, that's what keeps so many people in sin. I was thinking about this today, a lot, this afternoon. That's what keeps people in sin. That's what kept me in sin. You think you got so much to lose. You, you, people invest in, 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 in houses. Let's just take houses, for instance. I don't think anybody invests in houses. Yeah, people may own houses, but we don't invest in houses. People invest their life in houses. Buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling. And their whole idea of success in life is wrapped around that house. Their whole idea of love and affection is just wrapped around that house. Some people do it with people. Some people do it with boats. Some people do it with the stock market. Some people do it with a whole lot of different things. But it's wrapped around that thing. But when it comes down to it, what's the point? What good's it going to do? Like a friend of mine said, it's not real. It's not real. It's absolutely unreal. It feels real because we're in the flesh. It looks real. It, it, it brings enjoyment. It brings happiness for a season. You really feel those feelings toward people or things. But really, when you boil it down, what's it all for? What's it worth? When you stand before a creator, that house, that portfolio, those possessions, those clothes, those people, they're not going to be there. It's you and God. That's what it comes down to. He doesn't care about what kind of score you got in fantasy football. Can I get an amen? He doesn't care how many followers you have on Facebook. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. What matters to him is what you did for him. And sometimes that's where God is taking us. 
We get so wrapped up in things that he has to totally strip us away from all of those things. And we say, we're suffering. God, I'm blaming you that I'm suffering like this. And he says, I'm stripping you away from all those things because those things are unimportant. It's me and you. I died for you. Now, can you live for me? That's what it's about. And he has to get our attention. And it hurts. It hurts bad, doesn't it, church? Brings tears to the eyes. It breaks your heart. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Because this life is like a vapor. And those of us that have lost people, we know how quickly it's gone. And none of us in here tonight know that we will be around tomorrow. Including myself. And we can't go back one day. But we can go forward, can't we, church? And we need to support each other. We need to love each other. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Amen. Listen to this. Do something. Verse number five. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Huh. That's interesting. You know, Christians are the worst when it comes to God's blessings. You see, when Jesus said, I w- I, you have to come as a child. A child believes. A child trusts. And it doesn't matter how crazy it sounds to a child. You can tell them, hey, listen. I jumped up and grabbed the moon and I hid it in your bedroom. Oh, really? Yeah, go in there look. Okay. They believe it? Let me tell you this. These pews are made for us to sit on. But Christians are the worst when it comes to God's blessings. We feel like because we go to church, we pay our tithes, we we try to be nice to people, and we're doing the best we can, we feel like God's just going to bless us. But everywhere in the Bible, I read of things like, He said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Take up thy bed and walk. And she reached out and touched the hem of Each one of these did something. They got up and they did something. Even if they just cried out, Oh, thou son of David! Even if they just did that, they did something. These lepers did something. What are we doing? We all got to ask that question. Am I doing all I can? They said, you know what? We're going to do something. They got up and they started walking toward the Syrians. And God's word started coming true as they were walking. Because here's what the Lord did. As they were walking, it made them sound like chariots. And it made them sound like soldiers. And it made it sound like horses. And the Syrians were standing there thinking they had the battle won. But God's word was said by Elisha. And when God's word is said and pronounced by Elisha, it can take four lepers on their deathbed. But God will make it come true. It doesn't matter. When God says it, it will happen. Oh, it will happen every time, church. You understand this. Watch this. Let me get to my last point. I about jumped ahead of myself. Believe the word. Do something. <laughs> and number three. Accept God's blessing by faith. You see, faith got the lepers to stand up. They had nothing to lose. And maybe, that's saying, I got just a little bit of faith that somebody might throw us a piece of bread over here at the Syrian army. I mean, what threat are we? <laughs> Listen to this. Verse number five. No, verse number six. For the Lord had made, read that with me. For the Lord had made, read it loud. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, to come upon us. Do you understand that it wasn't the kings of the Hittites and it wasn't the kings of the Egyptians, but it was the whole host of heaven saying, When God says it, we will make it happen. Oh, it doesn't take this and that and the other. It doesn't take people's help. It doesn't take a big bank account. It takes God's word and it'll come to pass. It'll happen every time. God's word says when the enemy shall come in like a flood, that he will raise up a standard against them. A standard like a flood coming down the mountain. God says, no here, no now, no longer. They're my children. Welcome and praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. 
for you. Did the king just jump up? You see, the, the, the lepers, they walked in and like, what in the world? Uh, the animals are still tied up. Well, let's just walk over to this tent and knock on the post. Hey, nobody's here. The coffee's still hot. <laughs> they, they got the pastries all laid out. All right, let's spread out. Let's see if anybody's here. They all spread out. They start looking at the tents. Nobody's there. Nobody's there. Nobody's there. They all met back. Hey, everybody come back over here. <laughs> the food that the enemy was robbing us of. The drink that the enemy was robbing us of. Fear took hold upon them. The fear of the Lord took hold upon them. And all of this stuff is laid up for us. The wealth of the unrighteous is laid up for the righteous here. Amen. That's what God's word says. And we believe God's word. Now, they look around and they say, well, let's, let's get some gold. They started to hide gold. They got, they got the round stuff full, their pocket stuff full. They got, they, they're looking around, they start digging holes and hiding gold. They're like, whoa. I believe it was the same one that said, hey, let's go over there. Why would you, why should we just die here? He had some motivation. Let's go tell, let's go tell the people back home because guess what? No doubt they probably had some family in there too. So they go back and they holler to the king's servant, hey, go to the king. Tell him that the Syrians are gone and it's, it's ripe for the taking. Now I can just see the king. He's like, good deal. Let's go. Wrong answer. Did the king hear the word of the Lord from Elisha? Yes. Did the king believe the word of the Lord from Elisha? No. So his idea was simply this. It must be they're setting a trap for us. That's crazy. But let me tell you something. We all get that crazy. Amen. We all get that crazy sometimes where we're down and it seems like God's blessings. Whoa, 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 that can't be true. That can't be true. There's something else wrong. Why are we as Christians always waiting for the other shoe to fall? Why are we as Christians always seeing the glass as half empty? Or actually even worse than that. Who stole my half? Hmm? We ought to be the happiest, most optimistic people in the world. Because even if death takes hold upon us, we have a home in heaven. Hallelujah. We have friends and we have relatives waiting on us. And living in the light of God's love, it doesn't matter where you are. Unless God says it's going to happen, it won't happen. Because it has to go through the fingers of God to get to you. Come on, church. Ain't it true? So it's time we stop cowering around, wondering what's going to happen next, and start taking charge and say, let's go to the enemy's camp. Let's take back what they kept from us. That's what his word says. Hallelujah. <laughs> now watch this. The king should have believed by faith that it was God's word and it was going to happen. You see, the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, you would think it crazy if you had a loved one on a deathbed and I said, hey, put your faith in God like you have faith in that light switch. What are you talking about? That's crazy. But there's not a soul here that when you go to flip that switch, that light doesn't come on and you don't believe it's going to come on. As a matter of fact, you act absolutely crazy and surprised if it doesn't. And you probably flip it about three more times. Who doesn't? Amen? Because you have faith. That's what it does. You flip the switch, the light comes on. God has it under control, church. God has it under control, but you will never reap the blessings of God unless you take him at his word. You will never reap the blessings of God unless you believe the word of God. Absolutely believe the word of God. Don't think it's for that person, that person, but me and God. Listen, I've had people, I was talking to a guy probably three years ago, and I said, why don't you come to church? He looked at me and said, oh, me and God, we got things worked out. Liar! God does not contradict his word. When he says forsake not the assembling of yourselves, he's not going to say, now that's good for everybody but you. <laughs> we got things worked out. Oh, 
Your church is at the racetrack on Sundays. Gotcha. Oh, your church oh, is at the football field on Sundays. Oh, gotcha. It's fine. It's fine. I meant that for everybody. Your church is, oh, uh, up on the mountain. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's no problem. Are you riding a horse? Okay, that's good. No. 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 There's a reason God tells you to be in his house. You got to hear his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if you don't hear the word of God, then you get weak. And then you mess up. And then you come crawling back into Hadad's house. And you say, what happened? I just need God. Yes, you do. And then you get built up. And then you say, well, I'm strong enough. And I go back out. And it's a revolving door. Let me tell you something, hamster. Get off the wheel. Get in the church and stay there. Oh, amen, church. Amen. It's time to stop going around and around. Listen, there's good things in store. God has blessings in store. He has love and peace everlasting. <laughs> and he hasn't given up on you because he knew everybody would be here tonight, including me. And I need this. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> you see, here's why. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Isn't that what it says? We hear the word of God in God's house. Yes, we hear it on the radio. That's good and well. But there's nothing like being being around God's people. And, and, and God's people joining together and where two and three are gathered in his name. There he is in the midst. And, and when this one may be weak, well, this one over here is praying. And you can feel the faith and the prayers going and coming. Understand this. The Bible says in Hebrews, he said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. If God is not pleased, he is not going to send his blessings. Oh, listen, church, if I tell my daughter, baby, go in the room, and you better clean that room. Lord knows it needs it. Can I get an amen? And I say, baby, here's the deal. I'm going to give you $5, but everything's got to be clean. you got to hang up all your clothes. You've got to make sure this is dusted, everything's clean, bed's made, everything like that. And she says, Daddy is clean. I said, okay, baby. Now, Daddy is in limbo right here. Daddy is neither happy nor sad. Daddy is neither frustrated or irritated or thrilled to death. He's waiting. He's waiting to see the result of what she said she was going to do. We got a Heavenly Father waiting to see the results of what we told him we were going to do. Amen. So daddy walks into her bedroom. I'm just pulling this out of making this story up, although maybe there's some hints of truth in this. And I walk in the room, and it looks pretty good. I mean, she's a kid, so maybe she missed a little bit of the dusting, but you know what? Daddy can daddy knows that she's human. You know, daddy knows. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that he knows our frame. He said, I carefully knitted you together. Amen. He knows. He's not going to come in with lightning bolts and just all smite and I'm smiting you tomorrow. He loves you. He comes walking in. And daddy goes over to the closet and he opens the closet. And, huh. Pretty good. Things are hung up. All right. I will choose not to investigate any further in the closet. Daddy wants to be happy. <laughs> And then I see something out of the corner of the bed. Something's odd. Now, Leah already has her hand out. Huh? Kids, we God's children are there. God, where's the blessing? I made it to church. See, I'm living for you. I made it to church. But Daddy checks under the bed. Oh, Lord. And when I been down to look under that bed, the God-awfulest mess, I mean, you can actually see on a mattress where it's piled up that it's pushing the mattress up through the rails. I said, Leah! She's like, Daddy, you couldn't see it. Leah did not get $5. <laughs> I cannot bless her for obeying me when she did not obey me. 
Our Heavenly Father wants to bless us for obeying Him. He's wanting to. He's got the window already open. The bucket of blessings on the ledge. He's getting ready to pour and says, Please, come on. I wouldn't put this trial on you if I didn't know you'd make it through. I know the enemy's coming in against you, but I've raised up a standard. Come on, you're going to pass this test this time. And that's where we are right now. Amen? Because you're facing a test now, and you'll face one tonight, and you'll face one tomorrow. And the question is, how bad do you want daddy's blessings? Amen? I need them. I need them to live. I need his guidance. I feel totally confused and, and lost sometimes because I failed to ask God, God, what do you want me to do? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I feel like I'm in a, a never-ending desert sometimes, and I just, I don't know where to go, and I know that there's an oasis somewhere. And then finally, in my weakness, I fall to my knees, and I find it at the foot of the cross. You understand that all that time he was watching me, and he had the answer. Church, if you want God's blessings, believe the word of God. If you want God's blessings, do something. If you want God's blessings, accept God's blessing by faith. The next day, because he believed the word of God, Elisha was eating that fine flour. Amen. Starvation was gone. Exactly what God said happened, happened. But the smart out guy, the king's servant, when the town heard that there was food, you see, in the king's house he had many servants, and the king was suspicious, and that servant was like, yeah, right. He's right with the king. But there was another servant that had faith. And he said, peradventure, maybe, just maybe, these lepers are telling the truth. And there is food. And so by faith, he grabbed a couple of horses and a couple of them went out there. And they came back and told the king, King, it's true. The whole camp, it, it's empty. We can go over there and we can eat. Well, when the town heard that, they started rushing the gates. And as the king was making his way out, he got out because he's the king. But his servant got trampled. And he died right there. He saw it with his eyes. But it never came to his lips. How terrible of us Christians that we sit down at the table of Christ. And we see the food before us as it's been laid out tonight. But we never taste it with our lips because of disbelief. What are we going to do? With every head bowed and every eye closed.